Welcome ladies and gents, Chris Andre here. You can find me at Bet Boxing on Twitter. Of course, you can subscribe to the channel. Let's talk boxing. Let's start off discussing Jarrell Miller and his stoppage win over Lucas Brown. Big Baby got him out of there in round six. And I understand a lot of people out there are saying, I don't want anything to do with these two guys. Their blood is not even human anymore. It's basically a chemical, it's flammable, their blood. Why would you want to promote these sorts of guys? Listen, you have to understand something. Jerome Miller has served his time. And whether you like that or I like that or anyone else likes that is irrelevant. Unless you see changing in sentencing, maybe that's what you support. You support lifetime bans for purposely cheating. I know there's a crowd out there that do. If that's your position, fine. But until those changes are made, the fact of the matter is when anybody commits any sort of crime, once they've served their time, they're free men. And this is a guy who's 25-0-1 and could very well work his way into a position to fight for potentially a world title he's undefeated he's been calling out anthony joshua he's been calling out daniel dubois and people are talking about him people are interested in him as well so you can't just ignore his existence so we're going to talk about this display discuss it from a technical perspective as well as ask how would he cope against the likes of aj daniel dubois perhaps even you know the current champions alexander usik and tyson fury so in terms of this particular fight i actually had the first couple of rounds going to lucas brown because Jerome Miller is a guy that snowballs. He reminds me of one of those rolling boulders, you know, like the Indiana Jones movie where the boulder's falling after Indiana and he's running. <laughs> you feel as though you need to escape because this massive, massive man is coming towards you. If you hold your ground, he'll use his physical construct. He'll grab you. He'll lean on you. And imagine trying to carry that much weight, 333 pounds or whatever he came in at. Crazy levels of weight. That ring must have been reinforced with steel and had scaffolding on it or something. But the fact of the matter is you're having to hold that. If you don't engage physically, body to body, and you decide to move, he's quite fast with his feet for a man of that size. And one of the reasons is that he breaks certain rules. He won't come in behind the proper stance he'll often cross his legs as he's, he's almost running towards you but because he's got a very good chin and he's able to use, he's got good hand positioning as well from the defensive perspective we'll get to that in a moment but he's able to run certain red lights because he trusts his durability and he trusts your inability to hurt him so he puts you in a position where you have to work so if you stand your ground you carry the weight that's very physically draining if you don't stand your ground you're being forced to constantly move and punch back and a lot of guys seem to want to punch hard like they do with joe joyce in a bit to keep him honest but when they realize they can't they start to gas so he's a very difficult fighter to deal with he's a bit of a nightmare to be honest with you and that's why he's undefeated now prior to popping positive for the the drugs that he put tested positive for his stamina to me seemed to be a lot better and there was a more consistent uh faster entry point now he's a little bit slower with it but nonetheless he's still snowballing and he still puts that physical pressure on you now it's difficult to know how that would translate against a younger athletic top level heavyweight who can stick and move for the course of an entire fight and we'll get to that later on but in terms of lucas brown who's 43 years old he seemed to want to put on weight for this fight because in his mindset it was probably a case of i don't move the way i used to move when i beat chagayev when he was actually decent on the back foot so i need to put a bit of bulk on to prepare for our bodies coming together and i know i can punch so i'm going to look to land something big on jerome miller now as i've said the hand position he uses is very good to create a shield, an obstacle. And that means that you are forced to try and come around it or find gaps. And he will engage you with his hand too. He'll look to pat down on any lead shots that come your way or literally just use his arm to touch your shoulder, to press on your shoulder, to push you back and break your construct. There was one moment, I believe it was in the fourth round or third round, Lucas Brown shapes up to take an upper, to throw an uppercut. And as he leans back to throw that uppercut, you see Jerome Miller literally just slightly extend his hand and push back on his shoulder and as lucas brown tries to throw the uppercut he falls back off balance and the uppercut misses it falls short because his whole construct has been moved so although jerome miller is not this big snapping power type of heavyweight he's so naturally big there's so much mass there there's so much weight there that he knows how to use that and he uses those hands as an obstacle now when he's in defensive mode and he's not looking to apply incessant pressure and this example definitely wasn't the fourth round if you go back and watch the fight there was a moment whereby he plants his feet and he starts to change the level and he's bobbing up and down and he's bending at the waist and he shows that he's got agility right we know he's got agility but when he's in that forward momentum mode often his head won't roll as much as it should it won't come off the line as much as it should so he is very reliant on using the hands to either affect your construct or create a barrier that you need to sort of bypass with your shots and he's good at doing that 
Now, Lucas Brown was also very good at picking certain shots. He did find a few nice hooks to the body, nice little uppercut through the guard. He started to, at one point, draw the attempted parry of Jerome Miller in the second round. He started to do this. He threw a couple of jabs down the pipe. Jerome Miller tried to pat them down, and instead he came around the guard with a hook. So he started to land hooks on Jerome Miller. And like I said, we know that Lucas Brown, he may be 43, but he's heavy-handed. So he was hoping, can I stop this supposed Im immovable object in its tracks? And he wasn't able to do that. So after the first couple of rounds, I thought Lucas Brown outworked him, outlanded him. From the third round, you started to see Baby Miller go to work. And he's starting to throw these short shots on the inside. He starts to target the body nicely. He throws these cupping hooks, okay? They're almost like little slaps. He's not loading up with everything. And they're not even technically correct. It's sometimes thrown with the inside of the hand. So he's almost cupping at you. But like I said, he's such a heavy guy. There's so much mass there. One of his arms is like a normal human being's leg. It's like grabbing somebody's relaxed leg and just dropping it and letting the heel hit you on the head all the time. It starts to take its toll. And so that is what Jerome Miller is all about. Forcing you to work, knowing that he's very durable, doesn't really let you land flush consistently. And if you are going to land something flush, which you will, everyone gets opportunities against Jerome Miller because of the way he walks you down. You do have to think about what you're doing and quite often you might have to sit on your shots. And then he can throw a trigger counter or fall into you and use his physical construct. In other words, he's very, very good at making you fight his fight. And he bludgeoned Lucas Brown and ended up stopping him. And post-fight, he said, I want Daniel Dubois or I want AJ. We've got unfinished business. You know, he's got to be a man and step up to the plate. He can't leave his balls in his pocket. If he wants to fight, let's make it happen. He wants an easy win. He's fighting Jermaine Franklin coming off a loss, which I thought he beat Dillian White. So AJ, let's get it on. Stop being a coward. You know what I mean? Straight up. I mean, sometimes I find it a little bit baffling how people intellectualize certain things, by the way. I mean, in the one minute you're saying that, you know, why is Anthony Joshua taking a guy coming off of a loss? And then you're saying he, you felt he beat Dillian White. Well, make your mind up. Dillian White is a very proven heavyweight with a fantastic CV, one of the better CVs in the division. If you think he won that fight, then of course it would be a legitimate test for AJ. Now, just for the record, I personally do not feel Jermaine Franklin beat Dillian White. I felt an awful lot of the work he was doing was coming off of the forearms, elbows and biceps and shoulders, and they are not scoring shots. Yes, there's impact, but they're not scoring shots. That's not clean and effective punching. And I feel that a lot of people perhaps expected White to just blast him out. And because that didn't happen, people sort of gave a little bit too much credit to Jermaine Franklin and undermined Dillian White a little bit. Nonetheless, the point is that he feels as though he's the one that deserves a shot at Anthony Joshua instead of the likes of Jermaine Franklin. Now, how would he cope against Anthony Joshua? Pre-popping positive, I felt as though his momentum when he was entering the pocket was a little bit faster. He has seemingly slowed. He's still very effective at what he does, but there is a reason he was taking those performance enhancing drugs, right? If we are to consider the best possible Jarrell Miller, let's pretend as though it's Jarrell Miller pre-popping positive because he's going to make maximum effort. He's not fighting a 43-year-old Lucas Brown. He's going to come in as fit as a fiddle and he's going to want to walk AJ down. Anthony Joshua is a heavy-handed, vicious puncher that can box off the back foot. So in the first six or seven or eight rounds, Jerome Miller would be at massive risk of walking onto something big. And one of the things I believe to be a true sparring rumor is Deontay Wilder apparently stopped Jerome Miller in sparring and Jerome Miller had to go to hospital. And the reason I believe this rather than it just being a random sparring rumor is because Ness of the Boxing Voice was interviewing Deontay Wilder when he made this comment. And Deontay Wilder said to Ness, you just saw what I did to uh, Jerome Miller and he had to go to hospital I'm capable of stopping anyone and he starts talking about his his power basically but Ness was there at the sparring session and while Deontay Wilder's talking to him Ness is sort of smiling and nodding you can see both the interviewer and the fighter they're sitting on, on a ring apron now in that particular example if you're an interviewer you might pull a face or you might interject and say well you know I don't know if he went to hospital you're not going to go along with the story he also didn't go along with the story in such an over obvious way which makes you think ah that was propaganda like, you know like oh yeah De Deontay Wilder is his friend or something and he's trying to push that idea it just seemed to be a matter of fact conversation that was occurring so Jerome Miller although he's durable he can be hurt if he was to walk onto something against a highly skilled boxer like Anthony Joshua he could end up in serious trouble in those first six seven eight rounds however we do know that Anthony Joshua is an explosive athlete if he starts to tire and he lets go of all of that explosive work and cannot get Jerome Miller out of there, 
it becomes a very interesting fight in the latter third of the fight. Because he does keep going like a Duracell battery and we've seen that Anthony Joshua does have stamina issues. So the point I'm making here is, what would my pick be? I'd pick Anthony Joshua. But Jerome Miller is no joke. Regardless of whether you think he's a cheat and he's a disgrace and he's this or that, he's potentially a nightmare to deal with. And Daniel Dubois, you have to ask certain questions about his punch resistance, his mentality. A lot of people have questioned his heart. Jerome Miller is the sort of guy that will take you to the deep ends and drown you. Now, I don't think he would beat the likes of Tyson Fury and Alexander Usyk because they do not have stamina issues and they have showed the ability to move around the ring, particularly Usyk. Fury used to, of course. I believe his feet have slowed slightly, but he's still a good enough mover. But even if he's not, you're talking about another man with a big mass. And I'm not so sure that Jarrell Miller clattering into him and them tying each other up is going to wear Fury down in the same sort of way that it's affected other heavyweights. I think Fury might be comfortable tying up on the inside as well and allowing Miller to hold him. Fury might lean on some lax ropes and not feel that sort of um, heavy weight from Jarrell Miller. So ultimately, I think the way that you could potentially beat Jarrell Miller is for you to dictate the tempo. And that's a lot easier said than done, but I think the likes of Usyk and Fury are capable of doing that. Whereas some of the other top heavyweights, like I've already alluded to Deontay Wilder, I think he would probably repeat that sort of result that he had in sparring. But you look at someone like Joe Joyce as well, that becomes interesting. You know, who would have that thing of being more incessant? I think it would be Joe Joyce. I think Joe Joyce would stop Jerome Miller, but it becomes a great fight, right? You look at someone like Zilly Zhang against Jerome Miller, another really interesting fight. Because again, the big bang could clean him out, but we know he has stamina issues. What if you don't clean him out in the first four or five rounds? So there are so many fights there for Jerome Miller that whether you like him as a person or not, stylistically, he's fascinating for the heavyweight division. That's just the reality, guys. Let me know what you think. Where do you think he could go in the future? I understand loads of you guys don't like him. Leave that to the side for a moment. And just talk to me about an active heavyweight because that's what he is. Where do you think he's capable of going from here? Yeah, let me know. Please don't forget to hit a stiff jab on the like button, a right cross on the subscribe button, and an uppercut on the notifications button. It'll only take you one second, guys. Help the channel grow. Share the videos. And uh, yeah, I'll speak to you soon. Take care. God bless.